Hi there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I'm Liv. I absolutely fucking lutely love Greek mythology, even if sometimes it sounds like I think they were awful people. Many of them were awful people, but it doesn't mean I don't fucking love their stories and their existence and every single thing about them. Which leads me to... Yes, this is a podcast about Greek mythology. I will tell you the myths. I will try to make them entertaining and funny. Hopefully, I usually succeed. But also, I will always point out the mistreatment of women, and I will always point out how crazy some of the things they did was. Because what the hell is the fun of revisiting something from a zillion years ago if you don't emphasize the major issues with what went down? Do we learn from history or stories if we simply take them for what they were at the time? No. We analyze them, we learn from mistakes, because if we didn't, women would still be property. What is the value of retelling myths where women are ruined on a regular basis without pointing out that this is not an ideal situation? So thank you all for listening, all of you who get me and realize that I really do love these stories, but also they were fucking crazy, and that the purpose of this podcast is to address that. And with this, I welcome you to another brief interlude before we dive into the Trojan War. First, I thought it would be interesting to dig into one of the women who helped to cause it. A woman who loved herself, even if it meant fucking with others. Now, to preface, Aphrodite is probably my favorite goddess. At least, when we're talking straight Olympians. A lot of that love is because of nostalgia. I discovered her and myths about her in grade school, and I've been fascinated by her ever since. No female in Greek mythology is without faults, but then no female is entirely without faults. Plus, for the ten zillionth time, this was a patriarchy, so the odds were the ladies were the problem in any possible scenario. As we've seen countless times, there was a lot of victim blaming going on in ancient Greece. Thankfully, we've learned from our mistakes. This is episode 25. Aphrodite, sometimes good, sometimes bad, always naked. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty and sex and seduction. She is symbolized by doves and swans and roses. She is graceful and beautiful, and she has a temper. As I mentioned way, way back in the first episode where I went through the Theogony, the beginning of it all, Aphrodite was born of the foam that resulted from the castrated bits of Uranus that Kronos cast into the sea. Her birth and origins were super pleasant and totally normal, not at all troubling. It's said that this genitalia foam and Aphrodite from said foam arose just off the island of Cyprus in the eastern Mediterranean. I should say, Aphrodite arose from the foam fully grown, she was as old then as she was in all other depictions of her, And she's been associated with that island ever since. There's even a rock off the coast that is her mythological birthplace, and dear God, do I ever want to visit Cyprus just to see that single large rock. There are versions where she is in fact a daughter of Zeus, and it's even possible that there were two versions of her. One where she is a primordial being, born of the beginning of everything. That is the Aphrodite of the genitalia foam and the other where she's the daughter of Zeus and Dion, and where she is equal to the other Olympians, more human and flawed. But for the sake of clarity, I prefer the former, the single Aphrodite born of a nasty foam who is primordial and badass. Now, of course, being the goddess of love and lust and general sexuality, Aphrodite was crazy beautiful, sexy as fuck, just stupid good-looking. But this worried the men of ancient Greece, because a woman can't be that beautiful without it causing major issues. Life is fair that way. The gods were worried that the distraction of Aphrodite would lead to conflicts, wars. That men would be so obsessed with trying to marry her, or worse, that they would end up fighting each other endlessly. They worried this one hot woman would be the end of them entirely. Of course, mythologically, they weren't entirely wrong, or rather, they created their own issues based on this theory. Aphrodite did, after all, offer Paris the most beautiful woman in the world, which is why he took Helen, which is what started the whole mess with the Trojans. But I digress. 
they needed a solution to this problem that, at the time, wasn't a real problem. Regardless, they had decided they had a problem. And so Zeus decided that in order to get Aphrodite off the market immediately, he would simply arrange her marriage to another god. And who better to counter a problematically good-looking woman than the ugliest man on Mount Olympus? Hephaestus is a god I've mentioned before, though I don't believe I've actually explained his origins. I could go back and check, but I won't. Hephaestus was the son of Hera, just Hera. She was so upset that Zeus got to give birth to Athena all on his own that she created Hephaestus by herself in response. This was, of course, not entirely accurate. Zeus birthed Athena from his head, but only because he ate her actual mother. But Zeus took credit for Athena's birth, and so Hera wanted to make this even. But when Hephaestus was born, Hera found him to be quite ugly. And on top of that, he had one deformed foot. He would forever have a limp. Hera was so disgusted by this apparent monster she had created that she cast him off Mount Olympus. He was, of course, no monster. He was just a kind of blah-looking dude with a limp. Truly not the end of the world, but it was for the gods. Especially a goddess like Hera, who had something to prove. And there's something to be said for the fact that the one god that, in many versions of the story at least, only has one parent that is a woman, is the only god that is considered ugly and deformed throughout all mythology. Once everyone got over that he was just kind of blah, he became the god of the forge and artistry, the god of creators. Probably, if you stretch it, the god of podcasters. That's canon now. And so it's decided that the solution to the problem of Aphrodite being so hot that Zeus fears wars will break out because of how bad men want to marry, (coughs) have sex with her, is that he will arrange marriage her to the apparent ugliest god out there. And if that isn't an example of a man being afraid of a powerful woman, I don't know what is. Thankfully, Aphrodite knew her worth, and she didn't let a little arranged marriage fuck with the life she wanted for herself, or with her sexuality in general, for that matter. Her sexuality was, of course, her thing. And unlike most other married goddesses, Aphrodite was the one in the relationship who played around. Like, all the time. She was the Zeus, if you will. She cheated on Hephaestus with anyone and everyone, and... While it's not something to be condoned in standard society, when it's presented in comparison to what Zeus did with his time, I'm totally supportive of it. As a simple way of explaining the sheer number of lovers she had, Aphrodite had, depending on what versions of what myths you read, possibly up to 15 children. None of them were fathered by Hephaestus. None. Aphrodite's most frequent consort, as we'll call them, was the god of war, Ares. This is an Ares who was not also Professor Lupin, and who did not have a mustache. But I digress. Ares is the god of war, but not strategy or strength. He's the god of frenzy, of killing, the scariest parts of war. Though he's rarely depicted as scary himself— Same as how he's not really depicted as evil in any way. War was a fact of life, and he was the god of it. Aphrodite and Ares had sex. A lot of times. Like, a lot. The most memorable of these times, and possibly the time they fell in love, was during the Trojan War. Aphrodite and Ares were having sex. They were having sex in Hephaestus' bed. They were living on the edge. And the sun god, Helios... He caught them in the act. He saw them because, of course, he flies over the earth every day. Basically a professional peeping Tom. Helios told Hephaestus what he had seen, and Hephaestus got angry. He went to his forge, and he wrought chains that were invisible and also unbreakable. Then he went to his bedroom, which was by now empty, and he prepared the chains on the bed. Then he left. He told Aphrodite he was leaving for the island of Lemnos, But of course, he didn't go anywhere. 
With Hephaestus out of town, Aphrodite and Ares saw their opportunity. It would be a waste not to have sex in his bed, since Hephaestus wasn't even around. So shortly after he pretended to leave for Lemnos, Aphrodite and Ares were once again having sex on Hephaestus' bed. Afterwards, they fell asleep. God sex can be tiring. While Aphrodite and Ares were asleep, the magic, invisible chains made by Hephaestus went to work. They enclosed on them, trapping them to the bed so they couldn't move a muscle. Helios saw what was happening again, and again he tattled. He told Hephaestus what he saw, and Hephaestus walked in on the couple and quite in the situation. He was furious, and he called on Zeus and all the other gods to come look at what he'd found. He has a whole rambly rant, blaming his limp for the reason Aphrodite loves Ares instead. He was very worked up. As he ranted, some gods assembled to listen to him. Poseidon, Hermes, and Apollo. They stood in the doorway, and they saw Aphrodite and Ares as they were, and they started to laugh. Howling, can't-breathe laughter. Wheezing, coughing laughter. Apollo joked with Hermes, asking him if he would be willing to be chained to a bed just so he could lie with Aphrodite. Hermes said he would, that he would take chains three times as strong in exchange for that. Creepy jokes have been around a long time, my friends. But Poseidon didn't think it was quite so funny. At least, he didn't joke about it after his initial laughter. He was concerned for Ares. He promised Hephaestus that the gods would compensate him for this as long as he freed Ares. Hephaestus was hesitant, but basically all he wanted was compensation anyway. He knew his wife didn't love him, so he agreed, and he freed Ares. This time, though, when they were caught and trapped by invisible chains, was only one of many times that Aphrodite and Ares were together. Their affair was regularly referred to as love, in that she didn't love her husband and she did love Ares. Ares felt the same, and he is one of the few gods with no hint of an official wife in all mythology. He was for Aphrodite even though she was married. With Ares, Aphrodite gave birth to eight children, according to certain myths. They had a daughter, Harmonia, who you may remember from the myth of Cadmus and Harmonia of Thebes. She was also a badass and is one of my favorites for reasons that will hopefully become clear in the future. And they had the twins, Phobos and Deimos, who were the personifications of fear and terror, respectively. Together, they accompanied their father Ares into war, along with Enyo and Eris, who were sisters of Ares. And Adrestia, she who cannot be escaped, a daughter who would sometimes also accompany her father to war. She was the goddess of revolt, just retribution, and the balance between good and evil. She went hand in hand with Nemesis, a goddess of similar values. And they had the Erotes, a collective group of winged gods associated with love and sex. Eros is, of course, the most famous of them, and often the only one mentioned. The Erotes are less talked about. There are lots of possible names for the other ones, so I won't bother confusing you with multiple. They were often linked with homosexual love and were mischievous, pulling pranks and causing trouble. Other than Eros, they were kind of symbolic, a concept rather than distinguished gods. It's notable that it's with Ares that Aphrodite gives birth to the other personifications of love, as well as those of fear. They're connected in their own way, along with Harmony and Balance, their other two daughters. I would argue that the coupling of Ares and Aphrodite is one of the most important in all of Greek mythology. They represent so many things that would have been vital to the ancient Greeks, and of course are vital to us now. But like I said, Aphrodite wasn't only with Ares, just as she wasn't often with her husband. She had a great many lovers, most of which don't have distinct stories attached to them. And she was associated with others that have stories that link up to future myths I plan to tell, so there will be more to come. For now, we're sticking with distinct stories of Aphrodite's escapades. Aphrodite also had an affair with Hermes, and this affair also resulted in a child outside of her marriage with Hephaestus. There were just so many of those. But the child Hermes and Aphrodite had together is a famous one. When the child was born, Aphrodite gave him to the nymphs of Mount Ida to be raised there. This was normal. Gods weren't particularly child-rearing. They had other shit to deal with, other lives to ruin, you know. As the boy grew up, the nymphs saw a clear resemblance of both his parents. And eventually, he was old enough that he went off exploring. 
he came to a spring where he met a nymph named Salmachus. Of course, Salmachus fell immediately in love with the boy, because that's what women do, as we all know. But the son of Hermes and Aphrodite wasn't into it, and he told her so. But the boy couldn't resist the spring, and he dove into the water. In the water, Salmachus gave him a big underwater bear hug, and she called up to the gods. The gods fulfilled her wish, and the two became one. From then on, the child's name was Hermaphroditus, and they had both male and female genitalia. From a modern liberal point of view, I can't quite sort out whether this was the Greeks' way of accepting people born that way, or simply their way of explaining it. But either way, Hermaphroditus isn't associated with anything particularly bad, which is refreshing. And at the risk of being over-obvious, this is of course where we get the word hermaphrodite. And you can't tell the important stories of Aphrodite without the man who was arguably the most famous of her consorts. That would be a man by the name of Adonis. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, a woman named Mira. Mira was a casualty of Aphrodite, because Mira's mother had made the mistake of bragging that her daughter was more beautiful than Aphrodite. Of course, if you listen to the multi-part Cupid and Psyche episodes, you'll know that this is never a good idea. And as is all too common in Greek mythology, it's the daughter that's blamed for her mother's mistake. So as punishment for this insult, Aphrodite made it so that Mira fell in love with her father, which is a a whole other level of awful and gross, so I won't dwell on it. Long story short of it, she found a way to sleep with him in the dark so that he wouldn't know it was her. When he found out, he was troubled, which I don't blame him for, and he chased her with a sword which I don't condone, even in those circumstances. Mira ran from her father, and she prayed to the gods to help her get away. Much like our friend Daphne, this prayer resulted in the gods transforming Mira into a tree. In this case, she became the myrrh. But still, she was pregnant. Somehow she gives birth to a son, Adonis, while in the form of a tree. How does one give birth whilst a tree? These are the questions raised by Greek mythology. And they are important ones. Aphrodite found Adonis shortly after he was born, and she wanted him for herself. As a means to this end, she hid him in a chest, as one does, and then she brought the chest down to the underworld, to Persephone, for safekeeping. But Persephone peeked inside, and she too wanted to keep the child for her own. It's gotta be pretty boring down there, so I don't exactly blame Persephone for wanting a project. Persephone didn't have any of her own children either. I imagine she didn't want to raise a child of her own in the underworld, which seems kind. But I suppose a random child to keep her company, someone to care for, was easier for her to get behind. Aphrodite and Persephone quickly disagreed on who was the right person to raise Adonis. They both got quite worked up about it, and eventually Zeus was called in to listen to their arguments. He decided that Adonis would get to spend one third of the year with each goddess, and the final third with whoever he wanted. Adonis had taken a liking to Aphrodite, and he decided to stay with her for the final third of the year. Adonis grew up, and he grew up hot as hell. I've made this comparison before, and I will make it again. He was Jesse Williams' level hot. I have one go-to Hawkeye, and I will continue to use him as a comparison. Aphrodite, watching Adonis grow up, developed less than motherly affection for him. She appreciated how hot he'd gotten as he turned into an adult, and she was totally down to take advantage of the fact that she was not his biological mother, just the woman who raised him since he was a baby. Totally fine to then decide you love that grown-up child, not at all disturbing and super creepy. Anyway, Aphrodite developed a deep and passionate love for Adonis. She was so in love with him that she was with him all the time. She barely spent any time on Mount Olympus. Instead, she joined Adonis when he hunted, and basically wherever else he went at any given time. Again, not creepy at all. But one day, Aphrodite was not with him. Just this one day, he went hunting alone. And on that day, Adonis was gored by a wild boar. An awful way to go. And he did go. Adonis died from his wounds. 
The boar was sent by Ares, who was jealous that this young man had taken Aphrodite's attentions away from him. Aphrodite was up in her chariot, flying around, doing whatever gods do when they're up in their chariots. In Aphrodite's case, one that's pulled by doves. And from her chariot, she heard Adonis's cries as he lay dying. But by the time Aphrodite reached him, he'd already died. She covered him in a nectar used in death rites, and from his body a flower sprung up, the anemone, the life of which is frail and brief like Adonis. I meant to Google what kind of anemone exists on land, and I didn't, but I assume it's something, or else this is, or else this is just weirdly ocean-related. Well, that's Aphrodite, my friends. Just a lovely woman who loved sex. And there's nothing wrong with that. Except when you fuck over people's lives as a result. That's less ideal. Thank you all for listening to this episode of Let's Talk About Myths, baby. As always, you can follow me everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I'm just Myths, baby. Come say hi. With any luck, next week I'll be back with the Trojan War, the continuation of it. Unless I find uh, that I do a different episode instead. (laughs) We'll see. The Trojan War is a lot to delve into, you know? I just have so much time. Thank you again all for listening. You're all wonderful, beautiful people, and I'm Liv. I fucking love this shit.